we celebrate uh, this All Saints Day, we remember those who have gone before us, I came across a story I want to share with you. Or not. There you go. Uh, Saint Martin. Uh, he was a military soldier in the Roman army. And the story goes that as he was coming back from a campaign, he saw at the gate a beggar who was half clothed. And for whatever reason, he was moved to take half of his cloak, or his jacket, or his coat, whatever they might call it. He took half of it and gave it to the beggar, and the beggar immediately wrapped it around himself to keep warm. That night, Martin had this dream that he died. And when he went into heaven, he saw Jesus walking around with that same half cloak wrapped around his shoulders. And the angel asked him, Jesus, why are you wearing such raggedy clothes? And Jesus responded, my friend, Martin, gave it to me. And so Martin changed his life to determine that he would do everything in his life as if everyone he encountered was an opportunity to give to Jesus. That Jesus would be clothed with more than just the raggedy cloak that he had torn in half on his way into the city. And I suppose we all have in mind a question as we come to All Saints Day, what will it look like? when we come face to face with Jesus, what will that experience look like? Where will we go? And ultimately, what counts in this life that matters at all from this life to the next? The story that Jesus has given to us that was just read comes at the end of a series of statements about the end times, talking about the final judgment of the world and how it is as believers we need to be prepared to meet Jesus what it is we need to be ready for, how we might be continuously ready to share the gospel, how we might continuously be a part of God's work in the world. And today, as we're focusing on the various practices for believers, it's helpful for us to understand that this parable helps us understand one of the critical pieces that will be an evaluation for our hearts before God. Now, as believers, we recognize that Christ has died on the cross and forgiven us of our sins. However, there is still in Scripture several places where it recognizes that our lives will be weighed in terms of how we responded in this life to God's call to act according to His Word, and that the motivations of our hearts will be brought forth before God for evaluation. So Jesus tells this parable of the separation of the sheep and the goats as giving this grand, grand uh, finale to understand what that might look like. And so he tells this story about how it is at the end of all times when the king himself will be sitting on the throne. Now this is kind of an amazing piece because here Jesus as the Messiah, he is giving this idea, this concept of recognition that he himself will be the one who will be judging all people, all nations. And that all people will be coming before him to be recognized for who they are as a judge. Not often we think of Jesus as being the loving shepherd. We think of Jesus as being the comforter, our guide, our friend, our counselor. But in this passage, Jesus lifts himself up as that final judge, the arbiter between life and death, heaven and hell. Now, it was common in the days and place of Jesus that sheep and goats would be herded together. It's a whole lot easier to have one, you know, one whole flock of sheep and goats than to try to have two separate. I don't know if you've ever tried to be in two places at once. Jesus managed it a few times. The rest of us fail miserably. But the idea is at the end of the day, the sheep and the goats would together, they would, be, they would rest in different places. Apparently they did go long well at night, but they did okay during the daytime. But as they would come into the sheepfold at the end of the day, they would come in and the shepherd would recognize each of them and with his staff, push the sheep to one side and the goats to the other. So they would have separate resting places. And so Jesus lifts that up for them as a, a concept for how it is that we ourselves will be separated in that final day. And Jesus' words serve very clearly what it is that that is based on. And he simply says, When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you took me in. When I was naked, you clothed me. And when I was in prison, you visited me. 
Now, what's great about this is they, they simply didn't understand. They seem to think, you know, the righteous who are on the right hand, whom Jesus has given the pronouncement to, are saying, when did we see you, Lord? And you can almost have this sort of happy anticipation. Lord, when did we see you when you were out there? We missed you. While we were doing the good things, while we were caring for the poor, while we were helping the hungry and, and giving a drink to the thirsty, when did we see you? We somehow missed you. And Jesus says, even as you did it to the least of these, you did it also to me. One of the most amazing things we have as a central piece of who we are as Christians is that we believe that Jesus himself experienced exactly the same struggles and torments as the rest of us in humanity, right? We have a Savior who is not distant and removed from us, but has walked the journey of life with us. And even more so, as we look at this list of those pieces of hungry and thirsty and stranger and naked and in prison, we realize that Jesus himself was all those things. Jesus in his own body was imprisoned. He was falsely accused. He himself had his clothes stripped from him before he was put on the cross. And he is telling them that indeed, even as you have clothed the least of these, you have clothed me. Now what's interesting is that often in our Christianity, maybe in just America, we will often esteem somebody's worth based on their ability to have possession to some of these things. If somebody has a home, they have a certain credence, a certain credibility, a certain value of life. When persons don't have enough money for their clothes, can't smell the right way, don't get up for the laundry mat, they, they, we somehow take them down a little bit. And how low can we go when somebody's been in prison? Ooh, don't want to associate with those folks. But Jesus is saying, I was in prison. I was homeless. I was naked. I was hungry. I needed clothing. And for the righteous, you were there for me. When I was a stranger and looking for aid, you welcomed me into your home with welcome arms. And we ask, when did we see you, Lord? Do people lose their value when they suffer in this life? Jesus is saying that people don't lose their value because he, he has been the one who has taken on the fullness of suffering for all of us. So that there is no longer anyone who is the least of these because Jesus himself became the very least of humanity. Despised and rejected on the cross, spit on by the crowds as he walked through, he was the least of all. Yet Christ has been esteemed to be the king of all creation. If he is our Lord, how can we dare to say anyone has no value or worth before us? As believers, all people come before us as we are to follow Christ who calls us to serve. Those who care for the least of these receive the kingdom benefits for their labor, for what they did. And I simply need to ask, as we think about whatever you do for the least of these, you do for me, who it is, the least of us, that we might also be asked by Christ to care for them. In our community alone, there are opportunities to care for the least of these. And we don't do so because somehow caring for them will get us to heaven. I think there is this concern about whether or not this is works righteousness. A friend of mine, and, and, you know, it was one of those late night seminary conversations debating whether or not it is that somebody got to heaven because they did these good things, pointed out very simply, a sheep is a sheep. And a goat is a goat. Meaning simply that people who are doing those good deeds are doing so because there's been a transformation in our hearts for who we are that connects us with who God is so that we do the work of God because that becomes the very nature of who we are. There is a, a great quote that I've uh, run into by uh, Don Clifton. He is the uh, former chairman for Gallup. Remember Gallup polls? They, one of the main things that they do is they do evaluations of work in America and how it is we might be able to get more people employed and working in America. And he has this really interesting thing to say. He said, God did not make people to get work done, right? It's not like somehow there's a pile of work out there that God needed to get done. He goes, how am I going to do it? I'm going to create this whole humanity to get that work done. That's not what happened. Instead, he says it this way, God made work to get people done. What that means is that by participating in the work of God, something changes us. 
that we become transformed according to God's intentional design for who we are. So the, the core piece of the gospel message by Jesus is to repent and enter the kingdom of God, or to believe and act according to God's ways. Right? So the repentance is turning from the world's set of values and expectations and our own sense of self-worth and importance, and to turn from that as our way of living, to turn to God and asking God to determine for us who we are and where we are going. And as we walk with God, as we participate with God, God shapes us and transforms us into a new being. This is where John 3 talks about he who follows it is a new creation, right? They have been born again. It is as if we are a whole new being. And so, no, we are not talking about the works righteousness. What we're talking about is the evidence of faith that has been transformed within our life. God's work is a transformation of who we are in relationship with our world and our community. God's primary work, and I was talking with pastors about this recently, God doesn't care so much what you do, but He does care who you are. And the best way that God shapes who you are is by what you do. There's a kind of a correlation in that what you do has to do with this relationship with others. God doesn't need us to feed the poor because somehow they're hungry and there's no other way they're going to get fed. God needs us to care for the poor, to feed the hungry, to provide clothes for the naked, because it changes us into being the people of God. And there is an evaluation with the, the sheep and the goats as to whether or not we have allowed for that transformation to extend deep into who we are, and not just something we believe in our minds. Too often Christianity has stop right here at the brain level, right? I acknowledge that Jesus died for my sins, so I have received forgiveness. Amen. Hallelujah. But the truth of the gospel is it's not just an intellectual thing. The gospel is a whole body experience. It transforms not only our mind, but it changes our hearts so that we might love those whom God loves. It changes our hands so that we might actually do and connect with the world around us and to do the things that God wants us to do. And in Jesus, there is no separation between belief and action because in Him they are united. We cannot say, I believe, therefore someone else will do the work. We say, I show you my belief through my actions. And that there can be no separation between the two. In thinking about this, we have to understand secondly, what is God's intention for all the world? And God actually spelled this out pretty clearly in the Old Testament. He actually gave this to Moses. When they were entering into the promised land, God said this of what they were going to be. He says, there will be no poor among you. What an amazing promise, right? That somehow God is going to accomplish that there's going to be no poor among us. Now, how is that going to happen? It says, since the Lord will surely bless you in the land. That's amazing. God's going to bless us in a beautiful way in which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance for you to possess. But there's a condition. If only you listen obediently to the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all the commandments which I am commanding you today. Now guess what? Those commandments weren't just to go to church and pray. Those commandments weren't just give a tithe to the priest. The, the commandments were not just bring the sheep to the altar. The commandments were to give to your neighbor who's in need. The commandments had to do with caring rightly for those who were on the street. The commandments had to do to deal rightly with the immigrant, with the alien who lives in your midst, to care for them as your brother and sister. Those were the commands. Not just religious activity, but whole community activity. And God says, if you live into my will, if you live into my commandments, the ones I have laid out for you, the perfect society would evolve in front of you. You would see it and you would give glory to God. Now, we realize that this requires an activity of God, not to somehow just bless us abundantly, but God has to do something miraculous to transform our hearts. Because of our own natural inkling is to set up our treasures in our storeroom and to then shut the door and tell everyone, go deal with your own stuff, right? That is the natural human inclination for who we are. So there needs to be some supernatural power of God to change us from the inside out so that we become the people of God who live according to God's ways so that all of society is transformed and we see the kingdom of God lived among us. I've got some good news for you. 
There's an example of what that looks like. Because in Acts 4, when the Holy Spirit had been poured out on, this, on the church, do you remember how they, they spoke in tongues? And the thousands of people came to understand and believe in Jesus Christ? Something else happened as well. It says God's grace was so powerfully at work within them that there were no needy persons among them. The next paragraph says, because some would go and sell their possessions and give to the church so that everyone would have what they needed. The kingdom of God has been evidenced on earth at least in one point in time in history when people were willing to, by the power of God, live fully into who God's called us to be. That's an amazing truth. I don't know how long that lasted. Maybe it was five years. Maybe it was two months. Maybe it was two minutes when that was true. But that's the promise. When the Holy Spirit truly moves within a group of people, the kingdom of God breaks in and we see a new society among us. A society where there's no longer a stratification of people who have and people who don't because we realize that we are all brothers and sisters in Christ and that is the opportunity for us to care for even the least of these because it is in their face that we see the very face of Christ. We look forward to that day that Christ himself has gone before us. Guess what? No one's going to be homeless because Jesus, who is a carpenter, is building you a home. That's pretty amazing, right? This is the promise we have, not only the blessing of the Old Testament, that we will all have a place to be in the land, but we will actually have a place when Jesus has put your name on a you know, welcome mat. Welcome home. And that's the promise that we all have. For, for those who are willing to be transformed and to follow faithfully his call to our lives, we see that salvation is a part of God's intention for all people. There is no longer allowed for us who believe a separation between what we believe about Christ and the way we act towards others. Because the love of God compels us and must be evidenced by our love for one another. So today we have this challenge. The challenge for us to truly live as God's people, to truly allow for the love of God to have changed our heart in such a way that we might care for others. We have before us a very practical example. On two weeks from now, there's a community Thanksgiving meal. We've been putting this on as a church for about four years, five years. Every year, we get about 100 people coming from the community, individuals, families, women, children, men, all coming hungry, looking for a place to connect, to find food. And I can invite you as a church to participate in that this year. We Normally, you guys participate and provide the, the, the turkeys, and I am very thankful that you have done so. But I wonder if this year you might just show up. Would you be willing to, to sit at a table, sitting next to somebody, and to share a meal with them, to say, God loves you, and I love you too? Would you be willing to, not just to serve a meal with a nice long spoon, but to sit next to somebody as they're talking to you about how they have experienced difficulty in life and say, hey, can I pray with you? Put your arm around them and say, I care for you. This is a very practical ex example of what we can do. I want to share with you briefly a story from my own life. This is what really changed my heart. It was I was on a train in Chicago, and I remember thinking as I'm on this train, as a homeless man got on the train, I said, God, I wish there was something I could do to help this guy. He kind of smells funny. He looks funny. He's a mess. He, I just don't want to reach out to him right away because I, I don't know what to do. I don't have him. And I could tell that he was hungry. He, he at one point had a styrofoam cup and he began to kind of taking off pieces of that styrofoam cup and started chewing on it. Oh, this man so desperately hungry. I wish I could have something to give him. And we, we pulled into a stop in the northern part of the Chicago Loop in Evanston. And as we stopped at that stop, the, the train stopped and a policeman came in, pulled this guy off the train, put him in chains, and took him away. And I don't know what his history was. But I remember deep in my heart, I said, man, I wish I had something that I could have given him. And as the, pull, as the train pulled away from the station, I looked down, and I remembered that I had an extra donut. I should have done it. They, I bought that morning. It was one of those two-for-one specials, and I'd eaten mine, and I wasn't sure what I was going to do with that extra one. I missed the chance. I missed that one chance to give him the one thing he needed. This morning, as we hear the challenge, all of us have a little bag of something. A little bag of donuts. Maybe it's not donuts. Maybe there's something else that we know that God has called us to give. 
we have the opportunity to practice this habit of charity because it changes who we are as the people of God. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the many ways you continue to challenge us to be your own. I thank you that here in this church, in this space, your spirit is here with us, knocking on the doors of our hearts, that we might hear your voice and respond. Help us to be your people, your, your hands, your feet, your heart of love, that all people might know of you. In this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand here. I'm